both a little uh, a little weary, sleep deprived. A little bit. Or going to be here, you know, early. You had a meeting today. Always meetings. Uh, we, uh, you know, I, yeah. I have to get a 15-year-old up for school. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot going on. Uh, and we were at PNC Arena late last night. Thankfully, it wasn't overtime. Uh, we've all been there before. Trip Tracy, analyst, Hurricanes, now radio, TV is done. Shouts to uh, the entire crew at Bally's for, uh, for kick and tail during the playoffs uh and all regular season uh trip before we get into the hockey um escargot <laughs> caviar or calamari oh boy yeah you know like, that's a tough one thank to you set the tone with because <laughs> i would have always said calamari yeah um but I remember the first time that I tried escargot and just thinking about what a snail looks like. <laughs> I'm like, this is going to be junk. And it was great. And then actually, um, I was on a date in Chicago and uh, she suggested the caviar and with some ruffles, potato chips. And I never thought I'd like it. And I've been talking to Russians about it ever since. Wait a so, second. Caviar with ruffles? Yeah, it was a nice restaurant in Chicago too. And um, instead of those pancake things, uh, you know, I guess I, I I'm not a caviar aficionado, but nor, nor am I. With a Ruffles potato chip, I, I have to say they were really good. When I had escargot, and obviously that's the <laughs> referent, reference yeah. that escargot <laughs> moving in a snail's pace has never looked so good on Kuznetsov's yeah. penalty shot last night. I, you know, thinking about. You know, I don't think you look at a snail and say, boy, this is going to be delicious to eat. But I, I have to say, the few times I've tried it, I really liked it. <laughs> well, that uh, that was a moment last night, and I think one that Hurricanes fans will relish for a long time. Uh, and just n- knowing what we know about Kuznetsov right now, and obviously hasn't been here for a, a long time, um, I think he has made not only a performance impression, but I think an emotional impression with fans too um he has put he puts a lot of pressure on himself to succeed there was a lot of pressure in that moment because that game i mean 2-1 is 3-1 is a lot different than 2-1 i know it's only one goal and ultimately the game was tied after two periods but uh that is a big moment and it just seemed it like it took a long time from the time they ruled penalty shot to the time they spotted the puck and blew the whistle and let him go. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm glad you brought that up, A.G., because the referees did a great job there, and I'm going to tell you why. Kendrick Nicholson, who was the in-zone official, he was working the game with Wes McCauley, uh, he, if he doesn't kill the play, okay, because right. there was a little bit of a delay, and, and I don't know if Patrick Waugh was – Speaking about, did, you know, Romanov cover that he clearly did, but cover, you know, his hand on the puck temporarily in the crease, which is the criteria for a penalty yeah. shot, or did he just play with his hand, or if he was arguing that there was a slight delay there. The fact that Kendrick Nicholson killed the play, because if it goes on, even if you get together after, you can't revert back and award the penalty shot. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I think it was Brian Gibbons, the uh, linesman, that came right in. And I I haven't talked to the referees yet, but I would bet everything that I've got. He came in like he typically would and right at that whistle after Nicholson killed the play. And I firmly believe with pretty much absolute conviction that he confirmed from his vantage point mm. the fact that it met the criteria for a penalty shot. So I thought that was great teamwork from both Nicholson and Gibbons, and then obviously uh, Kuznetsov. Uh, it, oh, that's the other part of it. What a benefit. Rod's got to be thinking on the bench because <laughs> when you award a penalty shot, you can use any guy that's on the ice. And, you know, he's got the guy that, you know, we've watched him do it in the Washington Capitol uniform forever, and goalies are taught at a young, young age on breakaways. Never, ever, if you're playing a game of poker, show your hand right. first. And Varlamov finally got antsy <laughs> and showed his hand first with that stick. And, and Evgeny, he'll, he'll never divulge his trade secrets, but as well as I already know him, I guarantee he was just waiting for right. that. 
and then it's uh, lights out after that. Well, he certainly gave himself a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> it, it was about nine seconds from the time. I think it was like nine seconds from the time he crossed the blue line to uh, to when he released the puck. Probably wasn't that long, but it's probably six seconds. It's not six seconds to get from the blue line uh, to where he ultimately shot the puck. Uh, he was moving very, very slowly in the room. Yeah, I think snails are quicker, don't you? Oh, there's no, there's no question about it. There's no, absolutely no question. Uh, tortoise and the hare, uh, and and the snail, and the snail was uh, was definitely comes in third there. Trip Tracy is joining us here on the Adam Gold Show. So we've been talking about it. Rod said it after the the game last night. Andrei Svechnikov was the best skater, best forward certainly in the series. Jacob Slavin's probably the best player every almost every night because the what he does. And Slavin and Burns. Specifically, Burns, I thought last night was just absolutely tremendous. But the um, the way Andre played, it just to me, it made me think back to last year and how much more of an impact, how better Carolina could have been in the postseason with that guy on the ice because he looks like he's made for playoff hockey. Amen. Roger that. By the way, you mentioned uh, Jacob Slavin. Happy birthday to Jacob oh. today, May 1st. Uh, shares the birthday of uh, God rest my father's soul. Mm. And uh, when he walked into the building last night, I looked at uh, my watch and, and, you know, I just, I actually, another thing, I've tried octopus when I went to Greece. It had just become his birthday seven hours later in Greece. So I actually wished him a happy birthday <laughs> walking in. He was great. Uh, Svechnikov, um, you know, he finally gets a bounce last night off of Bortuzzo's yeah. stick. But you and I in our hot stoves throughout the series, uh, we talked about Andre a lot and how he was Carolina's best forward, hands down. And you know what I think about A.G.? Is I think about that stretch before his first All-Star game last season where he wasn't scoring, but he was helping the Hurricanes win on a nightly basis. And people, and I understand it, they get fixated with the ability to finish. Right. But when you really watch the game as, as Adam Gold does, you know, you, you see, A, that his preference, slightly so, is to be a brilliant playmaker, and that his uh, physicality was totally disciplined and game-changing, by far Carolina's, uh, you know, heaviest forward. Uh, and then he finally gets the puck luck last night that you hope will translate to start being able to finish in round two against the Rangers. But it reminds me so much of that stretch where the narrative was, why isn't Andre scoring before he, you know, went and won the fastest skater in that, in his first all-star appearance. But if you're really watching the game uh, in the, the ways that he's helping his team win or the best chance at coming out with winning result, he was outstanding in the five games. Yeah, he really was. Uh, and for me, right behind him, uh, is Seth Jarvis, who plays like uh -huh. he thinks he's 6'5", uh, and he's not. Uh, but, I mean, he does everything. I thought he was great again last night. Empty net goal, don't care. Uh, but uh, just on the first goal, he had two puck retrievals on the first goal behind the net on the Tevo Teravanen goal, which, frankly, uh, I thought that Simeon Varlamov probably would like a mulligan at. Uh, but I thought Jarvis was great again. Yeah, you know, he was uh, my bench interview on television, mm -hmm. and AG, and it, it was classic because, you know, he's got this tight relationship because he goes to Brent Burns' house all the time, and Brent's <laughs> son, Jagger, was on the bench, and Jarvis comes over right be five seconds before we do the interview, and, and I'm joking with Jarvis about, you know, and Jags is right there, and I'm like, yeah, Jags says that you're going to give me a junk interview, and then and Seth goes, Jags, you want to jump in here on this interview with us? My point is this. In my time in Carolina, there are only a handful of players that have been loose with the stakes so high in an elimination game warm-up, but then go in, you know, before the puck is dropped, and it's like Clark Kent going into the phone booth and coming out as Superman to turn on that compete. You know, I think about, uh, Justin Williams, of course. I think about Ray Whitney. Yep. I think about Mark Recchi, uh, in you know the in the push to win the cup in 2006. The, you know there are countless other guys that are elite hockey players that you know have that focus and that you know that look in their eye right in warmups. But Seth Jarvis, 
you know, with everything that was on the line last night, he was as loose as he always was in that bench interview, wanting to make it, uh, you know, a trifecta with Jagger Burns. And then like he always <laughs> does, like those other players uh, that I mentioned always did, is he has that ability to flip that switch and become a, just an unbelievable competitor with those two Huge assist. I love your reference to winning those puck battles below the goal line. Won a big power or penalty killing draw when mm-hmm. Carolina came up with that kill when it was 2 1 after the Riley power play goal. Um, he was versatile in the series, you know, playing with different centermen. He was great. Yeah, he was. Uh, Canes maybe dodge a couple of uh, a couple of bullets. I'm ho- I'm hoping they dodge the second bullet. We don't know for a fact. Jordan Stahl, I guess okay. I wasn't sure what the injury was. We were kind of blocked out. Um, you, see, I think you when we talked after the game, you said he might have taken a a, a, a skate to the uh, to the stalls or something. Um, but he came back and he played. Uh, but it almost looked like they were giving him ice or whatnot. For the 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 balance of the game, I don't know where they're putting it. Um, so what what do we know about him? And then the D'Angelo, because uh, he he left the game very late, but left the game and did not return. My expectation is is that Stahl is okay because that was very scary. It looked I can't remember the Islander player, but it looked like a skate that came up into that. Um, a tough area <laughs> and uh, and you know he quickly returned. And he did so I and I just listened to. Uh, Don Waddell Zoom a minute ago, and you know he didn't mention anything about Stahl, so my expectation is Stahl is good to go. He gave some very positive news about the x-rays with regards to Tony D'Angelo, that uh, he should be good to go in game one. And Don also mentioned that uh, he could see later on in, in the second round that Brett Pesci could possibly be available. Those were the big takeaways Ooh. on the health front in, in Don's Zoom that uh, just concluded. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest, I'm in incredibly skeptical of Pesci's return only because non-contact injuries never bode well uh, yeah. unless that was sort of a um, like a remnant of because a couple of shifts earlier was the I think was the Lee power play goal in game one or game two where um, P- Pesci kind of got twisted up on the play so he took two more shifts and he left the game after the that second shift after the goal so i don't know if if there was any relation uh to either play but either way uh man if pesci could come back i mean great for carolina maybe not so good for tony but i thought tony has played well so far in the two full games he's played totally agree and With three full know, games jack, yeah and you know jack drury gave on the game winning goal uh he gave tony a lot of credit yeah. you know when you look at that as as much as the Hurricanes struggled mightily in the face-off circle in Game 4, you know, when the game is on the line, Drury wins a draw. Yeah. And you have a set defensive zone uh, face-off play if you win the draw that Rod works on all the time in practice, where you have uh, a winger that releases uh, for a reverse from Tony, that mm-hmm. being Marty Natchez, which allows Brady Shea to immediately and seamlessly jump on the attack, and eventually you get a bounce and Jack Drury, the most popular and effective shot location, beats Varlamov, taking advantage of that bounce on the blocker side. Then all of a sudden on the bump-up shift, because face-offs are not just an individual statistic. Carolina didn't. You and I talked about it before the game last night. They did not have enough wingers diving in on 50-50 pucks Mm -hmm. in game four. And that clip, that neutral zone draw, where Kuznetsov, you know, maybe wins at 60-40, but both Coke and Emmy and Nason diving in to get possession that allows Brady Shea to even dump the puck in to get the bounce off the stanchion. Right. You know, with what faceoffs were coming into that hockey game to win those huge draws. And, I mean, I'd be totally remiss, A.G., if I didn't mention, you know, the Islanders are a very well-coached team. Yeah. Uh, you know, Patrick Waugh, aside from his charisma and his, his pedigree got the very most out of them and they showed right to the bitter end how resilient they were. But whether it be going with Jack Drury with the elevated role plus five, you know, best any player in the series in that key spot with Natchez and, and Martin Nook, uh, whether it be flip flopping the wingers in a when you needed life in game one uh, in a tie game going in the third period, whether it be the timeout and the goalie pull with two forty nine left when you're pressing you don't want to just give away a quick freebie empty netter. Rod Brindamore, the adjustments that he made, when to start both power play groups, including 
coming out with the Ajo mm-hmm. group second that led to Sveshnikov's power play goal. I, I'll tell you what, Rod Brindamore had a heck of a series behind the bench. I mean, we can say that a lot. Um, what you know, there's a there's a contract. <laughs> We're not going to get into it, but there's a contract coming, uh, and I hope uh, I hope we don't have to have this conversation anymore. Uh, this should almost be rolling uh, a rolling deal. Uh, when Rod's done, he'll let everybody know. That's my my feeling because uh, I've already fielded a bunch of uh, bunch of questions about this, and I don't want to field them anymore. So it's uh, we got to make this thing a, a done deal for a long time. Uh, Trip Tracy, your thoughts real quick going to the Rangers. We all know Carolina can be better offensively. I know they scored six goals, but there it was a weird game with a lot of crazy bounces uh, and own goals. There were three own goals in the game. Um, where where did they have to go to another level to beat the Rangers? Uh, very quickly in one word, amen to the point that you just made. Um, and then thinking about the New York Rangers, um, ah, boy, you know, you look at the growth uh, in, the, in the power play in particular that extended into the first round. You know, the penalty killing statistically wasn't what it was, number one in the NHL in the first round, but I think the Islanders were quite opportunistic. So I just think about in, in comparison to the second round a few years ago against the Rangers, you know, you felt like you, you, you were just trying to be even on special teams. Right. That whole mindset with total respect to the juggernaut that the Rangers power play is, um, it shifted. You feel like you can win the special teams battle with the New York Rangers. That just absolutely magnifies and amplifies growth. Uh, even if you're able to do that, which you are capable of doing, and you're capable of Anderson, and who knows if Kochetkov who played very well against the Rangers in, in the regular season. You'd like to see Freddie never relinquish the net. He's capable of going toe-to-toe and outplaying Shesterkin. But if Carolina is going to have a big edge in this series, they are better than the Rangers. Rangers are great, but the Ra- they are better than the Rangers at 5-on-5. Five five. Mm-hmm. And in particular, a big, big advantage for Carolina against the Islanders, the ability of the defenseman to move the puck and make your – weaponry up front truly truly advantageous so um i hope that uh carolina can you know rise to the challenge they're capable and win special teams that's a massive uh, area of growth and even being able to say that for the last few years that the canes have have earned but ag they're going to have to have more of a decided edge in five on five yeah. um and they're against the new york hockey club which you know they're capable of doing can they continue this 10-1 edge uh, goal differential edge in third periods boy was that ever goliath in the first round do you do you remember the last time the hurricanes started a playoff series on the road not as the road team because bubble hockey is different uh yeah. up in uh up in toronto remember the last time the hurricanes started boston? a playoff series that's right boston may of 2019 it is yeah, incredible boston. Of all the things that we talk about and how this franchise turned around, uh, the fact that they have had home ice advantage for every playoff series since then, other than the bubble year, it is just incredible. Um, sir, it's been, uh, it's been fun. We will continue to have fun. I'll see you in the radio booth uh, eventually, but I'll talk to you between now and then. Hey, G, I can't wait, you legend. And a big hello to, uh, you, you know, you, she's such a great compadre, your producer, uh, Victoria. You know, every I call her Mrs. Rogers. Every day is a beautiful day <laughs> in her neighborhood. T- today I'm, I'm flying high, even sleep-deprived like you after the big win last night. But if I ever wasn't, and I need to manufacture being a beautiful day in the neighborhood, nobody does it better than your producer, affectionately known as V, a.k.a. Mrs. Rock. Absolutely. It's a smile all the time. Aw, <laughs> oh, Tripp's the best. He is the best. All right, man. I'll talk to you later. Love you guys. Love you Have too, man. Trip Tracy here on the Adam Gold Show.